Yeah, so hello everyone and thanks to Tom um, for the introduction there and telling you a bit about the new as well, BA Honours in Psychology program. It's a very exciting time for psychology in Cardo College. Um, it's great to see so many of you here and you're very welcome to Cardo College St. Patrick's. My name's Claire King and this lecture is all about the psychology of first impressions, okay? So, so the first thing I want you to think about is if you, on your way in here today, and if you were to look around the room right now, um, we've already made some first impressions. So I want you to think, um, as you're walking in, and if you look around the room, is there anyone you think would be a good person? Is there anyone you think might be a bad person? Is there anyone you just have the impression that they would be a really good person? Or is there someone you thought might be a really bad person? And today we're gonna to explore why is that, right? What is creating these first impressions? Where are they coming from? What are some of the factors that underpin these, okay? What's influencing the decision? So um, the first phenomena uh, we're gonna consider is what's called the proximity effect. So researchers have found that we tend to have a preference towards um, what's in closer proximity to us. So I mean by that a geographical closeness, close proximity. That um, influences our impressions and we tend to favor uh, people in close proximity and it actually breeds liking. So some examples then of what we mean by close proximity um, researchers have found that we're more inclined to like and even marry people who live in the same neighborhoods as us, people who are in the same office as us, even people who um, we encounter daily, you know, in a parking lot, people who are in the same class, who sit near us in a classroom, any students here, uh, you could have your future spice, uh, spouse in the classroom, you know. And um, also, even in the same canteen, people that you eat your lunch with in the same canteen, it increases liking and increases the chances of uh, that's more likely where you're going to find your spouse as well, okay? So the proximity effect. Now, just to do a quick, just to ask you very quickly here, this is a famous, um, this is the Mona Lisa, okay, by Da Vinci. So I want you to consider which image you like more? So by a show of hands, if you could show me who prefers the image on the left? Yeah, okay, about three quarters of you. Who prefers the image on the right? Yeah, about 25, 30% of you prefer the image on the right. So, yeah, most likely people they find when they do this in research that people say the image on the left because it's the familiar image. It's the image that we're used to seeing and we're more likely to like that image than the mirror image, the image on the right. Um, now, interestingly, they've also found that when we see, when we show participants pictures of strangers' faces, the more they see a picture of a stranger, the more they like them, the more liking goes up. So um, it's interesting, even our own face, if you ask people, which image do you prefer? This picture of how your face looks in a mirror, which is a mirror image of how you appear, versus how they look to other people, how you actually look, people tend to prefer the mirror image, what they see in the mirror every day, because that's what's familiar, that's what's similar, that's what we've seen. So that impacts your impressions of others. Also then, um, researchers have found, for example, with these celebrities here, I've used an example of Mark Wahlberg and Matt Damon. They share similar facial features. And researchers find that when somebody shares the similar features to our own, we tend to find them more trusting, just because they look like us, because they share this, uh, this similarity in facial features as well. So that could have impacted some of your judgments of one another, your first impressions of one another on the way in. So why is this? One account for the reasons that underlie this, if you ask evolutionary psychologists, they would say, well, what was familiar was generally safe and approachable. We knew what it was. Um, we'd seen it time and again, so we treat what's familiar um, as safer, whereas what's unfamiliar could be threatening. So evolutionary psychologists say it's this hardwired tendency we have to do this, to trust what looks like us, to trust what's familiar and similar. But 
there's a huge problem with that, a huge problem, and it's the problem of prejudice. Because if we are hardwired to like more and trust more what's more familiar and similar, then it leaves us open to being prejudiced against what's not so similar and not so familiar. Because um, prejudice is when we prejudge someone, we, get, we assign them with negative attributes because of the group they belong to. So it's a problem of prejudice. So there are ways, however, of overcoming prejudice. So a few of them that we found are, uh, over 500 studies have found that having contact with an out group, so someone who's not like your immediate group of friends, some, a group that you're not familiar and similar with, has been shown to increase positive attitudes and reduce prejudice. So that's one way. They also found that this uh, benefit can be indirect. So if you have a group and just one person has contact with an out group member, someone who's not like them in some way, um, the whole group, prejudice levels in the whole groups reduce. So it just takes one. So if you're the person who's going out and meeting different from people, different groups, different ways of life, different cultural backgrounds, different ethnicities, if you're that person, the, everyone else you associate with in your group will benefit and prejudice goes down for the whole group. So it's very powerful. Another way of reducing prejudice is by remembering and always keeping in mind our similarities. So highlighting our similarities and a core one is our shared humanity. We're human beings. And by highlighting similarities, we also reduce prejudice. Another way as well is by correcting what's known as mirror image misrepresentations, right? Misperceptions. So, for example, in schools they found when they have one group and it's at odds and not speaking to another group, when they ask the first group, why aren't you speaking to them? They say, well, we would like to speak to them, but there's no way they want to speak to us. And when they ask the second group, why aren't you speaking to that first group? They say, well, we would speak to them, but there's no way they want to speak to us. So a simple way of reducing pre uh, prejudice is to correct these mirror image uh, misperceptions, and then groups can, prejudice can reduce, and new friendships can form as well by doing that. So there's things we can do. Yeah, so a huge area in psychology, there's lots of studies on this, is an effect called the halo effect. And it was first, um, it was Thorndike that named the phenomena way back when in, was it 1920, okay? And it's when we have a tendency um, as, as people, it's through our cognitive makeup, really, we're cognitive misers, so we tend to when we know an, an indi one individual attribute about a person, we tend to make a global assessment about the whole person based on just that one attribute. So um, it's when one trait then is viewed favorably, we tend to then view the all of the traits favorably as well. So it's like this ha a halo effect, and it was Thorndike that named it. But it's a really important effect when it comes to understanding the psychological phenomena under, uh, that it underpin our impressions of other people. So the halo effect then, an example would be, say if, if we think that someone's attractive, if you think someone looks attractive, we tend to assume all their other traits are favorable as well because they're attractive. So we tend to presume they could be, they're trustworthy, they're good, they're, they're nice, they're a nice person, um, they're caring, they're a good person, just because of they're attractive, they're, phys they're physically attractive. So this is a problem because it mightn't necessarily be true. So this is known as the error of the halo. We can't, we don't assess individually. We see someone's attractive, so we presume all their other traits are, are good and strong as well. Now the examples on the slide I have here of this, um, has anyone seen The Little Mermaid, the Disney movie? Yeah? And do you remember Ursula in that is, is, is the baddie? She's a bad sea witch. Um, and she also doesn't particularly look very attractive. So when she wants to fool people and she goes on land, she presents herself as an attractive woman, knowing that if, if someone sees someone's attractive, you're, you're e it's easier to fool people because we tend to assume all the other traits are favorable as well. But then it has very, it can have serious implications when you look at someone like Ted Bundy, who a lot of newspapers wrote about how attractive he was. 
in interviews with people, they found it hard to put together. This, this man is attractive, and yet he's, he's evil, and he's murdered women, he's butchered women, um, he's not a nice guy, and uh, putting the two together was hard for people. Even at his trial, there was newspaper reports talking to some of the teenage female witnesses in the court, just watching the trial, um, who said they just found him magnetic. He had a type of magnetism. They just couldn't, and yet he was on trial for horrendous crimes. So it's a really, it's, it's kind of like, it's a warning to people that the external does not always match the internal. So, yeah, just to bear that in mind of attractiveness and the halo effect. The halo effect then is not just based on appearance. It doesn't just apply when we see someone's good looking. If we first note that someone is likable, they seem really nice, they seem really likable person, we tend to then assess all their other traits more favorably, okay? So um, this study found that, for example, when a person appeared likable, their mannerisms their accent and their appearance also was rated more favorably too. So it's, the halo effect applies in a variety of ways. It's not just about appearance. What's interesting too about the halo effect is they find that when they inform participants of the halo effect and how it works and what it is, it's, they still fall victim to it. We still do it. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why researchers today are still investigating the halo effect, even though it's over 100 years later uh, from when it was first named, when the phenomena was first named by Thorndike. So just as there's a halo effect, there's also a horns effect. It's not always just positive. So with the horns effect, the traits rated unfavorably, then we tend to rate all other traits as unfavorably too. So if a person is seen as unlikable, we tend to rate lower all their other traits, so uh, based on the initial likability. So um, yeah, so there's a horns effect too. Now, it's, it, there's an interesting side to the, um, this as well in terms of, say, someone like Ted Bundy, someone who's high in uh, traits of psychopathy. If they look good, yeah, that can trigger the halo effect. But also, if you're very good at appearing likable, and people high in the trait of psychopathy tend to be very skilled manipulators, very skilled liars, very skilled at charming people. So if someone appears charming, and likable, um, we tend to also think that they're trustworthy and nice and caring and a good person. So it can have implications um, in, in for that as well. So just to bear that in mind too. Yeah, also then researchers have looked at how facial expression also impacts our impression of other people. So if you look at these two pictures, they're of Dean Norris. He played Hank in Breaking Bad. If you look at these two photographs, same guy, but just think what type, who are you more likely to find attractive? You know, the smiling um, or the scowling? Who are you more likely to trust? Who are you, you more likely to judge as threatening? It's the same person. They've just changed the facial expression. So researchers wanted to look into this. What way are our impressions of others impacted by the expression they're making on their face, whether they're smiling or whether they're scowling or frowning? So I want to bring your attention to this study. It was done in 2020, so it's one of the newer studies on the halo effect. And they showed participants images of uh, four different actors. So you have the older female actor, an older male actor, a younger female actor and a younger male actor. And they asked the participants to rate each picture, and you can see they're in different poses, so you have smiling, neutral, and scowling. They asked them to rate each picture in terms of attractiveness, facial maturity, honesty, how pleasing they were to look at, and how threatening they were. 
Uh, they used a Likert scale for this. It's often used in survey research in psychology. So it's just um, a level. So they would have said, do you, so would you mark as five extremely attractive, four somewhat attractive, three neutral, two somewhat unattractive, or one extremely unattractive. So like that for all the traits, okay? Threatening, extremely threatening, right to extremely non-threatening. So they rated each one. Already, can you kind of see which smiling or frowning, you know? Smiling versus scowling. Well, they found that smiling, so just facial expression, induced the halo effect, whereas scowling induced the horns effect. So in other words, when the pictures were smiling, they were getting higher ratings in, the, in terms of favorable traits, and when the pictures were scowling, um, they were judged as more threatening. So if we look at the graph, it's really, it illustrates it nicely. We can see that blue is the, the smiling photographs, gray is the scowling photograph. So if you look at attract, uh, how attractive the image is, when smiling, the rating of attractiveness is far higher than scowling. Facial maturity is how old kind of does the face look versus rather than baby faced. So you can see the scowling made people look older. You should all be smiling now after this, right? <laughs> You're sitting here. Honesty as well, smiling, were rated as being far more honest. So they're making assessments about the traits of these people based on just differences in facial expression. Okay, these are the judgments we make. Um, so yeah, honesty for more, more honest, pleasing to look at. So more pleasing to look at when smiling versus scowling, that's a big difference. And Another one of interest is non-threatening. So when you smile, you look far less threatening, which, and you look far more honest. That means people are more likely to trust you and not see you as a threat just because you're smiling. Um, yeah, so it's a good study. It really shows clearly the power of these effects. Interestingly though, when they compared the males to the females in those photographs, they found gender differences within the study as well. So there was a significant difference between uh, maturity, honesty, and threatening with males and females. So the males were judged as less facially mature. So the males were judged as looking younger, being more baby-faced. Whereas the, um, they were also judged as being less honest and being more threatening than the females. So that shows you that gender stereotypes that we have and gender biases that we have also impact our first impressions of people and our judgments of people. So based on photograph, photographs alone, um, you know, people are deciding that men are more threatening. The men are more threatening than the women in these photos. The men are less honest than the women in these photos just because um, some are male and some are female. And that has implications too then when, if you ever study criminal psychology on female criminals and how female criminals can get away with doing bad things and how overall female criminals tend to also get far more lenient uh, prison sentences as well. So we have to uh, consider gender bias as well in our judgments. So the halo effect also um, has implications in the online environment. So online, people use impression management. Impression management is just how we manage the impression that we're creating, how we manage the impression that we're giving others of us. And online, it's an awful lot easier to impression manage than face to face. Because online, we can take our time. You're sitting behind a keyboard, you can carefully choose what you want to say, you can edit, you can revise the words. Same with the photographs you use. You can use Photoshop, you can put on filters, you can choose which ones um, best, the, best put up the impression you want to create online of yourself. And also we have online catfish, which is a term for people who create a social media profile that's not of themselves, but they pretend it to be them. So they're using a different photograph. They're using a different name. They're saying things that just aren't true. So you can do that online. It's not so easy to do that face to face in the real world.
Yeah, so online then, we're we can use impression management to give a favorable impression of ourselves to other people, and we can al also tailor the impression we're giving to suit different audiences. So you might have a particular profile of yourself on Facebook that you want to present to your friends and family. You might change how you talk in, say, you're in a, say you're in a different group, a support group for some reason. You might show a different side to yourself in that group than you would on Facebook. So online, we can tailor the impression we're giving depending on the context as well. And of course, the impression might not match the reality. So online impression management then is also facilitated by online cyber effects, so such as perceived online anonymity. So when you're online, you can get a feeling that you're anonymous, that's perceived anonymity. And you can feel, no one can see who I really am, no one can see what I'm doing, and it can lead to this online disinhibition. You can feel disinhibited online and say things that you would never say or do in the real world because you feel anonymous, because you feel disinhibited. You also online can get an escalation effect, an online escalation effect where things can escalate very quickly. Um, and that can feed into then the, uh, um, the impression you're given and how it's um, being impacted on others as well. Um, so these online effects then can help give you, uh, manage your impression of yourself you're presenting online, but then also um, is impacted by the halo effect online as well. So it means that because online you can carefully choose what image you're given, carefully manage your impression, but we have to remember an, an aesthetically pleasing Instagram or account holder can, um, will be better received and be thought of as having particularly positive personality traits because they're attractive. So if we remember the halo effect, what we judge to be attractive, we also then assign all other uh, positive traits too. We increase the liking of everything. So it has an implication then on how people are thinking of celebrities and of influencers online just based on a photograph. We make this assessment of them. The halo effect also can work in very unexpected ways, the type of judgments we're making on a person based on just what they look like. For example, Research has found in 2020 that people seen as attractive on a website were also judged to be less likely to have an STD. So it's completely, in a way, irrational, but it's affecting these judgments that we have of people, and that can have implications. Research also finds that people who look high in physical attractiveness also tend to get rated as high in political expertise. This is just off a picture. This is just how attractive they present themselves. And with the halo effect triggering, we think, oh, there must be higher in political expertise as well. And with the rise in social media use, it's become easier now for political candidates to impression manage online because they can take time. They can have a team of people doing it for them. Um, so it can mean often that the candidate who actually appears more attractive and appears more charismatic and appears more likable, because remember the likability study, if you appear more likable, we're assessing you in favorable ways as well, they're the ones that get nominated rather than the most capable. So it can have real, real implications for who you're voting for as well. Um, and the problem is you can drive people towards a decision without any idea of what the decision's actually based on. Okay, be it on an impression, be it on their, how they look attractive, or how they appear to be likable. So we're going to have a look now at some of this impression management online, okay? So, um, this is, these are some pictures of Boris Johnson's Instagram. So these are ones on his Instagram, so they would have been very carefully selected for the impression that they give of Boris Johnson, okay? He's using impression management. So what do you think, looking at the pictures, you can see what do they imply? So if you look at the first picture, he's surrounded by workers. You know, I'm one for the working people. I'm one for the workers. Um, on, his, on the second one, then, I'm very, I'm a serious, uh, 
you know, uh, international relations. There's a picture of the map behind him as well. And the third one then, I don't know, I obey COVID regulations. <laughs> um, and as young people in education as well. And look at the last one then, he's in a sea, a sea of young people surrounding him. Um, so again, I'm for maybe future generations. I understand young people. I care about young people. I care about the future of the country. So we can see the impression that the Instagram account is creating of this um, figure of Boris Johnson in this case. Do you want to see what's not on Boris Johnson's Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> so when, and this wouldn't be chosen because the impression that a picture like this gives, right, is quite the opposite. You know, maybe an idiot, maybe a buffoon, you know, um, stuck up there, patriotic maybe, but yeah, so you can see it wouldn't be chosen. It's not the image his team would want to put forward of him. Then Micheal Martin, Micheal Martin's Instagram. So what impression do you think Miho Martin wants to give in his Instagram photos? So again, there's kind of a similar similarity here. This time it's a sea of women instead of a sea of children, but they're young, you know, you can see in with the people, um, they're young people too. So again, the future, uh, I care about the young people and about their futures, so having the young people here, they have a place. Um, again, very serious international relations again. Um, and then the last picture, working hard at his desk, phone in hand, down with the young people. You know, nice guy. Do you want to see what's not on me on Martin's Instagram? <laughs> completely different impression. Completely different impression from one photograph. That would say, say, I, anger, anger. It's, there's no likability there. Remember all the, uh, so if it's unlikable, we also then would assume it's threatening, you know? Um, yeah, unattractive. And yeah, so you wouldn't see a picture like that on his Instagram. Leo Varadkar then, this is his Instagram. Are we seeing kind of similar, similar styles of impression management for these people? You can see again, there's Leo with the working people. I care, I care about jobs and employment with the, work, with the working people in action on site. Again, uh, really obeying COVID regulations in this one and with the workers in a sea of children, <laughs> as you do. Um, I'm there for the future, I care about the future. Smiling pictures as well. So smiling triggers the halo effect. I care about the future, schools, education, because they've got their school bags on. So we're making all of these other judgments and assessments based on one photograph. So for fairness, do you want to see what's not on Leo Varadkar's Instagram? <laughs> so completely different impression based on one picture. So again, similar maybe to Boris, you know, Maybe a bit of a buffoon, a bit of an idiot, kind of gormless, doesn't really know what he's doing. You wouldn't think capable and, um, you know, able of running a country, would you, from, based on this one picture? And that's why it's, people can be very, very careful online what they put on their Instagram. People also can use animals to help with impression management. You notice that with the politicians um, as well. They get snapped with different dogs. If you notice, what message do you think these dogs are sending by being included in these photographs? And notice they're very similar dogs. You know, they're small, cute little fluffy little white dogs. The subliminal messaging there with old Simon Harris isn't so subliminal with his vote yes, but it's like you have here, um, you know, I'm, I, there's a softer side to me. You know, I can be gentle and cuddly and caring, and I'm not all, you know, harsh. I've got nice, soft edges. Um, yeah, so the use of animals as well in impression management. Look at the dogs in this photo. <laughs> Very different than the photo that the two men have. Why do you think, like, if you look at these dogs, first of all, what type of dogs are they? Does anyone know? Yeah, Irish wolfhounds, yeah. 
how very apt for Mary Lou, who's a Republican, to have that. <laughs> what a coincidence. And if you look as well, there's three, look at these, three big dogs, right? Sends a very different message than the men with one little cuddly dog. Um, it's more an impression of, you know, I can, I, I have strength, I'm strong, I can, ha I can tame these three big dogs, you know, I can play with the big boys, I have a seat at the table, I'm just as strong, just as able. So it's a completely different side of herself Mary Lou wants to show with the use of animals than the others want to show with their use of animals. What impression do you think that calendar creates of this man? <laughs> do you know who that is? Rambo, yeah, very good. It is, yeah, it's Putin. And, and in a way, it, it, he is trying to create an impression of Rambo, the man's man. I have my shirt off, I'm riding a horse, I'm hunting in the woods, I can do these mach macho, it's like extreme machoism kind of stereotype. Um, and look at his use of dogs. The puppy doesn't look happy at all. It doesn't look comfortable at all in that picture. But he's still trying to use animals, you know, and taming animals and killing animals. It's kind of conquering animals, isn't it? You know, the, the big fish, the leopard, the dog. Um, so yeah, so it is, um, there's a particular impression that he's definitely trying to create. Would it work for me, Hall Martin? No, and, that's, and that shows as well when it comes to the impression management and how um, we have to also bear in mind the culture that people belong to um, in terms of the impression they're creating too. Do you remember Leo Varadkar took off his top in Phoenix Park during a heat wave? Yeah, and the newspapers were not happy with him at all. How very dare a politician in Ireland take off their top, put your shirt on. So it just doesn't, it doesn't translate. Um, but this does as well, I want you to bear in mind that there is a sinister side to impression management because um, people can use it to cover up and distract from abuses of power as well. So Stalin, before the internet, where, which made it easier to impression manage, um, with doctored photos, he had a cottage industry where he, he doctored, had doctored thousands of photographs, thousands. And one of the main reasons he doctored photographs was to erase people that he'd killed from them. Okay, so this is one example of thousands. There's another one where um, he's in a photograph with three generals who one by one he has executed. So the first one snipped from the photo, the second one snipped from the photo, the third one snipped from the photo until it's just only Stalin remains. So um, also Stalin used photographs and he used photograph technicians to make him look taller in photographs and to make him look more attractive in photographs, such as by a smoother skin. He had pucked, kind of pox on his face. In the photographs, they made him look like they, he had smoother skin, so he'd look more attractive. And now we've looked at the halo effect. You can see how powerful that can be. It's not just he's making himself look more attractive, when we rate somebody as more attractive, we tend to rate them as more likable, more trustworthy, more honest, less threatening. So it has implications. It's creating a bigger impression. Yeah, so when it comes to politicians and impression management going forward, I want you to remember that it doesn't matter if politicians are speaking in print, broadcast, or online, we're always getting a carefully curated image or message that they wish to portray. So uh, just to kind of recap then for you, um, we did start the lecture, we looked at how the proximity effect, people tend to like and even marry those in close proximity. And that could be in a classroom, in a car park, in the office, in the canteen, in your neighborhood, the proximity effect. We also looked at how people tend to like and trust what is familiar and similar to them. And we looked how this could lead to the problem of prejudice, but there's ways to overcome prejudice by reaching out to outgroups, remembering what's similar to ourselves, and remembering that different groups probably do want to talk to each other. So correcting those mirror image uh, misperceptions. Also, we looked at the halo effect 
how one favorable trait can impact our perceptions of all others, even in terms of, oh, they're attractive, they're less likely to have an STD. All sorts of ways, all sorts of ways. And we looked at the horns effect and how one negative trait then impacts negatively on all others. They're not very likable, and then we also tend to judge them as not as attractive, not having as nice mannerisms, not having as nice an accent. We also look then at smiling and scowling and how just facial expression alone, we can then infer a lot of other judgments about somebody just based on are they smiling, are they scowling? And how smiling was the one that appears more honest, less threatening, makes you appear to look younger as well. Um, so many benefits. Then we looked at gender differences and how in, the, in that study, it was the men who appeared to be more threatening than the females based on just picture alone and less honest as well and younger. We looked at impression management then and how impression management is facilitated by the online environment and by online effects as well online. And we looked at the consequences of impression management, how it can impact on our, voter, on our, vote, on our choice as voters. So we could be voting for somebody and have no idea what the decision's actually based on. So we have to do our due diligence and look at their policies, try and get something objective before we make decisions that have um, consequences like that. So yeah, we looked at voter choice. Now, anyone that came and was wondering, or for anyone wondering, I'm going to an interview, or I meet, or I'm going on a first date, or I am inviting my, meeting my in-laws for the first times. How can I make a good first impression? Just a few tips on that too while, we're, while I have you here. So I would say, starting from the feet, if you're meeting someone and you want to make that good impression, make sure your feet are facing them and not the door. People read that, number one, as that you want to leave. I would also say, keep your arms open. When you fold your arms, cross your arms, it's red as defensive. Even though it's, it's not, often it's self-soothing and it's just a very comfortable position to sit in. But it's still misread a lot of the times as defensive. Let's try and keep them open on a first meeting. And smile, we've looked at the power of a smile with the halo effect. Even when people wear masks, we can tell when they're smiling. There's a, a, a Pan Am smile is a smile that just moves your zygotic major muscle, okay, from your mouth here. And uh, whereas a real smile, a real Duchenne genuine smile, you, you're moving your zygotic major, but you're also moving the muscles under and over your eyes as well. So even with a mask, um, you're still, you can still see when someone's smiling properly, authentically. So always smile. And I would say as well, um, use the person's name if you know it, because using someone's name helps build rapport. Isn't that right, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thanks for listening, everyone. I'll take any questions that you have now. Well, the thing is, yeah, and the both are good questions, so I'll answer both, you know. The first one in terms of accuracy, research finds that our first impressions, so, and there's all different things that are at play when we make them, including your own subjective, of course, but the accuracy of first impressions has been, uh, is approximately 76% accurate. So usually we are pretty good, but it still leaves 24% where you're getting it wrong, you know what I mean? So it's worth investigating it, even for the 24%, okay? Um, in terms of bad or good, um, th that's the thing. When I say bad or good, I mean, I really meant in context of this lecture, favorable or not favorable, okay? Like, um, like we looked at some of the traits, positive or negative traits, Whereas if people are all bad or all good, like, no, of course not. And as a psychologist, like, if you study, um, Miriam King, who's another um, assistant lecturer here, she has a lovely research now that's on um, do dark traits have bright creative sides? And Miriam, uh, through her research on the dark traits and reading her research, has shown that in the dark traits of the dark tetrad, which are sadism, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy, 
Only 1% to 2% of the population are very, very high in dark traits, if that's the way we assess bad or good, you know? But there's also light traits of Cantonism, faith in humanity, and humanism, and only 1% to 2% of the population are very, very, very high in all of those traits. So most people are actually on a nice bell curve and are, and are a mixture and are gray and are a bit of both, and that's the way, that's the way so people are. the social psychological phenomenon that you know, the Lucifer effect, any good person can do bad. You know, um, not necessarily, because I think it is a bell curve. So I think it depends. I really think it depends on the person. And just how, I'd say there's always the people like Anne Frank, for example, who was very high in faith in humanity, said things like, um, I still believe people are fundamentally good at heart. I think people that are very high in the light traits wouldn't do bad in certain situations. But, uh, but I do think it depends on the individual. And that's the great thing about psychology too. You can come up with a theory, but at the end of the day, we're all amazing individuals too, and there'll always be individual differences in psychology. Um, I don't think I don't think it is hard because when we look, if you're open to it, it, say for example, right, you heard something bad about someone, like you said, and you say that's it, I, that's it, I'm done with them, then you're never going to get that familiarity that increases liking. Whereas if you're around someone, you're with them, then you're then they're benefiting straight away from we tend to like what's familiar. So if you spend time with the person, they become more familiar, and then you get to know them better and hopefully build up objective reasons for liking or disliking rather than. An, an initial, and the first impression is within seven seconds, so it's quick. So, you know, it, yeah, I'd say it, it's subject to change as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think so, like, and, and um, so you're asking really, do you think that where the way someone is is the way someone always will be? Yeah, no, I don't think so. And I think, I, I, and I think um, I'd be a very rigid and inflexible psychologist if I was to think that, you know, because look at therapy and look at exposure and look at how if, if, if I have never met someone from a certain um, group, say, for example, and I go and meet them, my positive attitude increases and my prejudice decreases. So I've changed. I've changed in my attitudes. And if you look at um, even Piaget, cognitive development, it doesn't just stop. You're constantly changing the way we think. Our schemers are constantly assimilating and accommodating different information. So human beings, I think, can always change and grow and change who they are. Yeah, I do. I think there's always scope for change and betterment as well. You know. So yeah, I wouldn't agree with that saying. Get rid of that saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's it's I'd say it's a lot harder to change a bad person impression because of the our our defense mechanisms might go up towards that person. So we want to protect ourselves. So we we're probably more likely to say I'd rather take it as a bad first impression and then run the risk of somebody hurting me or my family or well, I'm not going to get in the car with Ted Bundy. I've got a bad first impression. It's not happening. You know you don't want to you might want to risk. Whereas if you have a good per first impression of someone, that's probably har would be harder to shake. I'd say because it's good. You're well. Welcome in it. You're like, this is great. So yeah, I'd say bad is harder to get rid of, definitely. Yeah. I think I think that we can all yeah, this is why it's this is an interesting thing too, because we find when we tell people about the when researchers tell people about the halo effect, they still do it, right? So how can we overcome it? How can we and I think it's because we only we have a limited cognitive reserve, okay? So if you think about first impressions in terms of if I'm walking down the street, okay, like looking is not seeing, right? It's not processing. So I'm walking down the street and I can see all around me, there's lots of signs, there's different cars, there's lots of different faces, right? 
but it's so, it'd be too much for me, right, to take in and remember and really see every single individual aspect of that, right? So can you imagine how mentally, how, it's, see, we're cognitive misers. This is why we do first impressions. So you imagine how mentally exhausting it is. Every single person you meet and you say, okay, I'm not going to form a first impression. I'm going to find out, are you a nice person? Are you a trustworthy person? Are you someone who's a humorous person? Are you, an, are, you an, are you introverted or extroverted? Are you open? Are you closed? Are you into books? Are you? So we, make, we have to make these kind of... Um, assumptions in order to kind of because to free up space in our for other things it would just be too you know so there is a place for them but I would say if you know your first the first impression that you're making of someone is going to have a big impact like who I vote for or will I invite this person into my house right then you want to know a bit more than just a first impression and that's when to really bear it in mind and go and look for objective look at the policies, or look for objective ed evidence. I'm going to talk to a few people that know this person, or I'm going to wait and know them for a longer period of time rather than going off my first impression. So I think we can do that. We can be careful um, with our first impressions when it has consequences for us. That's what we really need to say. Because we couldn't, every single person we encountered, we couldn't really pull out each single trait one by one. Because there's ones that we don't even think of that were that, like the STG example that we wouldn't even think are being impacted, but they are. So it's very hard. It would be too cognitively draining to do it every day. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it kind of is, you see, because intuition, um, when Langer writes about intuition, she writes it about a lot for mindfulness. And she defines it as an accumulation of information not perceived by most conscious minds. So that means it's not perceived. So we are perceived, per that person's attractive. I'm, I, it's in my consciousness, I'm, I'm, I, you know, and now I can make these all these other assumptions. Whereas intuition, um, according to Langer, is more of what we're picking up in our sub, so it's little subtleties that you wouldn't, and that's why they actually say, research finds that listening to your intuitions is one of the principles of luck, and they find that people that do listen to their intuition tend to be far luckier. And if you look at someone like the person that didn't get into Ted Bundy's car, she said he was attractive, he was a really nice guy, he was turned, but her intuition was like, get out, get out, get out. Her intuition was screaming at her. So I do think they're different. Yeah, it was a good, que a good question though. Yeah, yeah. And 